Okay, we are live now. So good evening, everybody, and uh, very warm welcome to this special lecture by Professor Jaram Chengalur from the National Center for Radio Astronomy, Pune, uh, which is a national center of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, Professor Chengalur is the dean of NCRA. Uh, Professor Chengalur obtained his uh, BTEC in electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur in 1987, and then uh, did his PhD at Cornell University uh, in 1994. And thereafter, he worked in the Netherlands at the famous uh, Astron Institute before joining the NCRA in uh, 1996, where he has been uh, since for the last 24 years. Uh, Professor Chengalur is one of the uh, foremost researchers in radio astronomy internationally and in the country as well. And he's a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences and the Indian National Science Academy. And today, Professor Chengalur will be uh, tracing the history of radio astronomy in India, the development of it, which was pioneered by none other than uh, Professor Govind Saroop. You may have uh, heard of his name, uh, of course, I'm sure, uh, who passed away recently, unfortunately. And uh, Professor Chengalur will be taking us through this journey of radio astronomy, which is now a very successful enterprise in India. Professor Chengalur, I invite you to start your talk. Yeah, thank you, Anvish. Uh, um, so, um, um, you know, uh, and we've been charged with talking about Govind Swaroop and the development of radio astronomy in India. And, um, you know, uh, I am going to try and be uh, true to that uh, title that was given to me. So I feel there are some, you know, some things I'd like to say before I start uh, the talk itself. So, uh, you know, the first uh, clarification I'd like to make is that I'm not trying to give a general introduction to the development of radio astronomy in India. I'm uh, going to talk about Govind Swaroop and uh, his contributions primarily to the development of radio astronomy in India, which are, you know, uh, enormous. But at the same time, if one were to talk about um, uh, radio astronomy in India in general, uh, there would be other names and other, uh, you know, uh, developments that uh, one should uh, take note of. Uh, but I won't be doing that today. I'm really going to focus on on the on on the work that Govind did. And uh, secondly, because of this, the talk is going to be partly biographical, and you know, particularly in the early part uh, of the talk. Uh, but I will try and draw uh, you know um, connections between uh, whatever biographical things I say, and uh, you know, the work which came later. Um, and of course, uh, you know, given the theme, uh, you know, and this uh, biographical nature of the theme, uh, we are not really going to be doing, uh, you know, an introduction to radio astronomy. I think you all have probably had that anyway already. But we will, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, perforce because of the topic, we will touch upon uh, radio astronomy, the, at least the techniques of radio astronomy a little bit as we go along. I won't be saying very much at all uh, about the science that is done with radio astronomy. And uh, finally, you know, this talk uh, is, um, uh, I'm being given to the NIUS students, but I understand also that it was meant to be more of an evening talk and at more at a kind of popular level. So I have tried to keep, you know, as much as possible at a relatively popular level, but I've also, you know, got some technical things in here, not, not a great deal and not very, very technical, but nonetheless, there are some, uh, you know, technical details that I get into now, you know, which should be uh, uh, relatively straightforward for NIUS students, but, um, you know, for non uh, people from a non-technical background, um, there may be some things which you, you know, just have to uh, let, uh, skip over. Uh, and finally, the story that I'm going to tell is, of course, interesting in itself, but I think it's also a very useful uh, reminder for us. Um, you know, I think we tend, um, you know, uh, to take the existence of facilities and institutions a little bit for granted. Um, you know, we assume that, yes, of course, uh, you know, there are opportunities to do science, there are institutions to do science, etc. Um, and... Um, you know, when we do that, we tend to forget, um, you know, the effort and, uh, you know, just the chair, you know, the huge chain of uh, things which needed to be in place for these facilities and institutions um, to come into being. Um, and, you know, we tend particularly also, I think, you know, at the undergraduate level, uh, 
when we're reading science and so on to 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 you know to uh, think of it as a kind of knowledge you know knowledge which somebody sitting yeah you know in a room and thinking deeply about things has come up with ideas and things and so on and so forth and put it all down um, and uh, we lose uh, uh, track a little bit i think of the complex interactions between science and society which is the thing which allows both science to grow and of course uh, society to flourish and so i think this story that we're going through today is a little bit of a correction to all of that it's sort of you know uh, both the story of the development of radio astronomy in india but also more broadly about the development of facilities and about you know all the thing ways in which science and society interact um, to create uh, you know the science ecosystem that we have around us today so with that, let me start. Um, so I'll start with something uh, biographical, some biographical, simple biographical details of Govind. Govind was born uh, in 1929. I haven't given the date over here, but in 1929 in Thakurwada, which is in uh, Uttar Pradesh. And he was born actually to quite a well of uh, rich landowning family. Um, uh, and, you know, his father and his grandfather had, uh, both, you know, they had both land and they had uh, business enterprises of various sorts. And so the family was quite well off. Uh, Govind's mother was particularly keen that he should become an engineer, but um, Govind himself um, wanted to do study science. And his father sort of felt uh, it important that he be allowed to follow his inclinations. And so he did in fact go and study science. So he did a BSc at Ewing's Christian College in Allahabad. And that's the photograph I'm showing you over here. And then an MSc at Allahabad University. And uh, his time over here uh, culminated, uh, uh, you know, uh, it overlapped and culminated with the freedom struggle uh, for, for the, you know, the, the, the uh, freedom struggle culminated in, in, in independence around the time that Govind um, was doing his BSc and his MSc. And all of these uh, had a very strong uh, influence on his character and his thinking as um, you know, it did for many of the scientists of his generation. And so that I think is something that we, uh, you know, I think marked his uh, career as he, you know, uh, through, through the years, uh, the ideas and the um, ideals uh, that he acquired at that time. The other thing I'd like to note was that he had actually very good teachers. He had excellent teachers, including K.S. Krishnan, who a name I'm sure you're all familiar with, who um, had worked with Raman uh, on, on uh, discovering uh, the scattering, which is now called Raman scattering, and for which Raman got the Nobel Prize. Um, and, uh, you know, these teachers uh, made a very deep impact uh, on Govind. And I think that impact had two, you know, was twofold. One of them was that it motivated him very strongly uh, to take up a career in science. And secondly, and I think equally importantly, it gave him a very lasting conviction about the critical importance of very high quality undergraduate education. So that if he was convinced that if, you know, science was to flourish in, in the country, it was very important to have high quality undergraduate education. And I'll, I'll come back to, to these. We'll come back to all these themes as we go through the talk. All right. Uh, so um, uh, as I said, um, independence happened around the time that Govind was finishing his MSc. And uh, K.S. Krishnan, who had taught him in his MSc years, was appointed as the first director uh, of the National Physical Laboratory, which was established very shortly after independence. And Govind joined NPL uh, uh, after finishing his MSc and started working with K.S. Krishnan. And so he was assigned, um, the first job he was tasked, he was assigned by K.S. Krishnan was uh, to develop instrumentation for, for measuring paramagnetic resonance at, uh, at a wavelength of three centimeters. And uh, this was a high frequency compared to the kind of things that people had done, uh, at least in this country before. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Govind uh, was in a way starting from scratch, starting cold, but nonetheless, he managed to make this equipment in three months. And, and he did this using a surplus World War II radar equipment, which happened, um, which NPL happened to have access to. And also, uh, you know, with help for uh, understanding how to go about the design, et cetera, from a very important uh, series of volumes called the MIT Radiation Lab series. So this had been, uh, uh, this was the fruit of, uh, uh, you know, research done at MIT again during World War II. 
uh, for uh, radar uh, research. Um, and uh, they had come out in a series of volumes, I think maybe even 28 uh, volumes altogether, very detailed uh, and very, um, you know, uh, informative and very influential volumes as far as uh, microwave engineering was concerned. And um, yeah, you know, I, I recall, you know, even decades later as an undergraduate, um, you know, going uh, through uh, these uh, radiation lab series. But again, this, our themes we're going to come back to this, this fact that there was a lot of development of technology in World War II uh, for radar. And also that after the war, um, there was surplus equipment left over, which then uh, could be used uh, uh, for, for pursuing science. Right. So this is uh, the first uh, project that Govind had done at NPL. And in his biography, he notes that Krishnan actually was very impressed and pleased with him uh, for having been able to do this project uh, very quickly and successfully. And now here is where we start getting into these, um, you know, these uh, felicities and these odd ways in which science develops. So in 1952, ERSI, uh, which is a large body of, uh, of uh, radio scientists and international body, the, the premium international body of in, uh, radio scientists, they met, they had their general assembly in Sydney in Australia. And K.S. Krishnan uh, happened to go uh, for that general assembly. And uh, several of the presentation in this General Assembly were in this new field of radio astronomy. And in a way that was not surprising because Australia was one of the very few countries in the world at that time uh, doing radio astronomy. And uh, you know, it, uh, it had a very clearly a leadership position and it had built a large number of very innovative radio telescopes. So it was natural that if there was an assembly of radio scientists over there, uh, there would be a number of talks on, on, on radio astronomy. And so K.S. Krishnan attended these talks. Perhaps he even went to the uh, visit some of the telescopes. I'm not sure whether he did or not. This photograph is uh, 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 taken uh, during the General Assembly, but it doesn't uh, show K.S. Krishnan. It's just uh, uh, other uh, astronomers at um, one of the telescope sites. In fact, a site called Potts Hill, which we'll run into again. So, but, you know, K.S. Krishnan was uh, very struck by these new developments and this new field of radio astronomy. And uh, so maybe I should, you know, just um, for people who haven't heard of radio astronomy before, let me just say a little bit about radio astronomy. I think I have a one slide introduction to radio astronomy. Uh, so radio astronomy started um, with the serendipitous discovery of radio waves by Karl Jansky in 1931. And so this is a photograph of Karl Jansky with his telescope. Um, uh, uh, and uh, what he was doing was uh, he was working for the Bell Telephone Laboratories, which was uh, 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 wanting to set up a transatlantic radio link. And uh, to set up that link, they wanted to understand what all are the sources of radio noise which would affect this link. And so they had set Karl Jansky the task of uh, identifying and characterizing sources of radio noise. He was a very careful uh, uh, engineer. And uh, so he, he did this observation very meticulously and he realized that there's a faint but very clearly detectable source of noise which arises from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And that was the first uh, uh, source of, uh, of radio frequency uh, energy detected outside of the earth. Right, so it was um, a, a, a discovery which caught the popular imagination. Uh, it received considerable coverage in the press, but interestingly enough, it was not followed up by professional astronomers. And the reason for this, I, I, I think, is uh, twofold. One of them, which I have put down over here, is that the techniques uh, used by radio astronomers are very different from those used in optical astronomy. Radio astronomy um, required a kind of engineering. Uh, basically an electrical and electronics engineering, which was very different from what the optical astronomers were familiar with. Uh, they did not have these kind of expertises in the departments of astronomy that existed at that time. And so I think for that would be a strong reason why it never really got uh, picked up a whole lot by people. And the other is, uh, which we'll come to uh, and look at in great detail, is that uh, these early radio telescopes had a very, very poor resolution. So Karl Jansky was able to say that the radiation came in the general direction of the center of the galaxy. Uh, 
but you know, it's not that he could actually pinpoint it to the center of the galaxy, but it was a reasonable guess to say it came from the center of the galaxy. But in general, uh, the resolution of radio telescopes was so, so poor, it was very difficult uh, to associate any given radio emission with any particular source that the optical astronomers could see with their telescopes. And uh, so because of that, it was impossible for them to, to, do, to progress this field a whole lot because, um, you know, it was like, uh, it was apples and oranges. They, it wasn't tying together to, to give a more coherent picture uh, of the cosmos. Uh, and we'll come to that uh, in a bit. So, you know, after this 1931 discovery, uh, there was a little bit of work by uh, an amateur, but more or less, it's fair to say that progressive radio astronomy stalled until the end of World War II. And uh, at that time, there were two factors which sort of caused a big spurt. One was that um, there was this huge group of electrical engineers who had been involved in the war effort, particularly in the development of, uh, of, of radar. And, uh, you know, as part of this, many of them had realized as they were setting up and testing their equipment, that there were other sources of radio uh, waves in the sky, uh, which they were not able to follow up. Uh, during the war time, but which immediately after the war finished and they returned to their universities, um, you know, this was things that they began following up on. What are these radio sources? Where are they? And so on. And the second was at the end of the war, there was a lot of surplus radar equipment. And so it wasn't, uh, you know, it was uh, relatively straightforward for these people to, to sort of rejig all of this um, uh, uh, to make equipment to detect radio waves um, from outer space. All right, so now let me just look at this thing which I'd mentioned briefly, uh, you know, that the um, radio telescope's resolution is very poor. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and this is something I'm sure all of the NIUS students are, are familiar with, that although, <clears throat> uh, you know, we talk about a parabolic antenna having a focus or a parabolic telescope having a focus, uh, the images which you make with a telescope with a finite size, um, uh, you know, even if I have a point, uh, like a point source, like a star or something, if I make an image of the star, I don't see a dot in the image. In fact, uh, what I will see is, is a pattern like the one which I've shown you uh, 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 on this thing, where you see a diffraction pattern, like what is shown on the screen. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the central dot gets uh, smeared out, blurred out. And um, you also have these um, uh, diffraction uh, sort of uh, side lobes or rings or whatever you'd like to call around them. And uh, the size of the central blur um, that, uh, you know, a, a point like source is uh, smoothed out to depends on the wavelength. And that's a formula I've given you over there. It's one, you know, roughly 1.22 times the wavelength that you're observing at divided by the diameter of the telescope. Now, radio waves uh, that we're talking about have extremely long wavelengths compared to optical waves. Um, it can be millions or even more uh, times longer than optical waves. So, um, you know, the angular resolution of, uh, of early radio telescopes was very poor, and I'll show you an example uh, in a bit as we go along. And so early radio telescopes certainly could not make out anything about the internal structure of radio sources. And further, they could not locate them accurately enough for people to be able to identify which is the optical source which corresponds to this radio source. And in the absence of that identification, as I said, it became, they became like two distinct fields. There was a bunch of radio sources, but nobody knew anything more about them other than the fact that uh, they emitted radio waves. And of course, optical astronomy continued along uh, whatever research path that they were doing. Uh, they, you know, so in that sense, almost radio astronomy was almost not some, you know, almost not astronomy beyond being able to say that it's coming from the sky, it's not coming from the earth. There was very, very little, I mean, there were certainly certain things you could say more about it. And, and the sun, for example, was studied in detail because that was one source where it was clear, which is the source that we are observing. But apart from that, um, you know, there was very little progress um, yeah, that could be made uh, in radio astronomy and understanding the nature of the sources. So, you know, uh, supposing I do want to make a, a, a radio telescope to match an optical telescope in resolution, right? So, uh, as I said, the resolution goes like lambda over d. Uh, the optical wavelengths are uh, given by things of that, of that nature. If I have a, an optical telescope, its angular resolution is typically of the order of an arc second, which is set by turbulence in the atmosphere. 
for a one arc second, so let's say I want to get a resolution of one arc second at a typical radio wavelength of say 21 centimeters. Uh, uh, and so then I would need a radio telescope, which is about um, uh, 20, 200 kilometers in size. And so that, you know, just to, to put that kind of pictorially, I've shown a 200 kilometer circle roughly uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 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 superposed on a map of Maharashtra. And you can see that it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, the proposition that we have over here is obviously crazy. There's no way that anybody can build a, a telescope that large. So if you do want to, uh, to get very high resolution, uh, it's instead obtained by a different technique, uh, a technique called interferometry. And again, I'll just motivate it very slightly, um, you know, that supposing instead of uh, observing a source with just one antenna, I have two antennas, and I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, you know, you have one antenna here and you have another antenna there. And I have a source which is not vertically overhead, but you know, at some direction. So the, ray, the rays from that source are coming along this direction. So you can see that the ray or the wave front will hit uh, this antenna first, and it'll hit the second antenna after some more time. And so because of that, uh, the signal at the second antenna is delayed or has a phase difference compared to the signal of the first antenna. And if that phase difference is exactly um, uh, an integer multiple of two pi, or exactly, you know, this distance is an exact integer multiple of the wavelength, the two will add up in phase. Um, on the other hand, if it is, um, uh, uh, you know, half a wavelength uh, 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 difference between the, the two path lengths uh, or, uh, you know, uh, pi radians apart um, the, the in phase, uh, they will cancel, right? So uh, you can see, therefore, if I had a source which was vertically overhead, um, uh, the, 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 uh, 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 the signal at the two antennas would add up in phase, but if it was at a small angle uh, theta, off uh, from the vertical, uh, then the phase difference between the two would go roughly like uh, uh, L theta divided by lambda, of course. And um, yeah, so uh, the uh, resolution then uh, would go as L over lambda, where L is the separation between the two antennas and not the diameter of the two antennas. So I get some information about the location of the source uh, uh, with very high angular resolution, by, with a resolution corresponding to the separation between the two antennas. So I could, for example, conceive putting these antennas many kilometers apart, and that would then um, give me, uh, you know, uh, uh, an ability to, to locate the source uh, with high uh, accuracy. It doesn't give me imaging capability, uh, but it at least allows me to locate uh, compact sources. Um, and we'll come back to these ideas as we go along. So basically, if you want uses uh, interferometry, uh, more than one antenna to add up the signals, you can uh, begin to locate source quite, sources quite accurately. And uh, so, you know, and uh, in Australia, they had come up with a very clever idea where you do all of this with only one antenna. You don't need to use two antennas. So what they did was they put an antenna uh, on, uh, on, the, on, a, on the edge of a cliff right next to the sea. And uh, now you look at uh, some source. And uh, so here is the antenna over here on the cliff. And uh, the, that antenna is going to receive two signals. Uh, it'll receive a direct ray from the source. It'll also receive the ray which has uh, hit the sea. And the sea turns out to be quite reflective at these low radio frequencies. So it acts somewhat like a mirror. So uh, it hits the sea over here and is reflected. And uh, it gets collected by the uh, and same antenna. So this antenna will now see both these rays and depending on the phase difference between these two rays, you'll, you'll get constructive or destructive interference. Uh, and that phase difference, of course, will depend on geometric factors like the height um, of this cliff and this angle uh, that uh, the source makes with the horizon, that is, which will of course change as the source rises and sets. Right. So, um, so you'll see, if you just sit and observe with that antenna, you will see an intensity which varies with time because uh, this path length will vary with time. And so you'll get um, interference like, uh, you know, increases and decreases in your intensity. And uh, that allows you, um, you know, because the distances we are talking about over here are large, they could be many hundreds to uh, kilometers kind of distance. It allows you to uh, accurately locate the source, assuming that it is compact. 
if the source is not compact, uh, you know, if there's one part of the source where the path lengths are such that things add up in phase, there would be another part of the source where things are such that they add up out of phase. And on the average, you would expect all of this would come out in the wash, and so uh, there won't be any strong interference patterns. So, but if provided the source is compact, you would see uh, these interference patterns, and that would allow you to locate the source. And uh, that's how some of the you know, first identifications of uh, radio sources were made. So for example, the Crab supernova remnant was identified as one of the bright radio sources in the sky. And that immediately told you then that supernova remnants uh, are capable of, uh, of generating uh, radio emission. Um, so Anvesh had asked me to stop from time to time to check if there are any questions. So maybe I'll do that now. Anvesh, uh, is no, any I don't see any questions from the chat. So I yeah. think uh, you can go ahead. All yeah. right. All right, so let me continue. I'll press on. Uh, so, um, you know, so uh, this was a bit of a digression on radio astronomy and, uh, you know, things happening in radio astronomy in Australia. Uh, and the reason we digressed into it was we were, you know, at that point in our story where uh, Sir K. K. S. Krishnan had uh, gone to Australia for uh, attending that earth sea meeting and where he heard all of these exciting new developments in radio astronomy and the field itself was new you know this, he heard all about this exciting new field of radio astronomy so when he returned to india you know ks krishna decided that we sh he should try and set up a radio astronomy group at the national physical laboratory and so he set up a group with a bunch of young uh, mscs um, who he the, you know sort of talked to and inspired to take up this new field and that was actually a, a, you know, a, a turning point because several members of this group that K.S. Krishnan set up went on to become quite distinguished radio astronomers. So, uh, you know, so K.S. Krishnan had decided that he'd like to set up a, a radio astronomy group in India, which was, a, you know, a, a bold step. But uh, if uh, one were to proceed with it now step by step and ask the question, okay, now what? Um, yeah, it turns out uh, that uh, the first thing one would do is to try and understand uh, how, to say, how to do radio astronomy, how to build a radio telescope and so on. And since no radio astronomy had been done in India, it was difficult for people to, you know, to, to figure out how to do all of these things. And so it was decided that, you know, probably some people should go to Australia to CSIRO uh, in Australia, which is where all the radio astronomy was being done. And, you know, get some exposure to this field, understand the techniques of the field and so on. And so Govind left uh, for a two year assignment. Uh, with CSIRO in Australia in February of 1953, and he was funded under something called the Colombo Plan. And, you know, again, you know, these are all uh, strange things which uh, fall together at the right time. The Colombo Plan itself came from an initiative by an Indian diplomat called K.M. Panikar, who was, um, felt it was important to set up, uh, you know, schemes um, by which human resource uh, in India and other South Asian countries could be developed uh, rapidly. And so he had uh, set up an international group, which provided, you know, not monstrous amounts of funding, but sufficient, um, you know, and which made a significant impact to allow people uh, to go um, and get trained in various um, uh, things. And, you know, it, it did uh, this whole scheme, which I think is still running uh, as the Colombo plan, has uh, over the years provided, you know, quite made a, quite a significant impact in human resource development. So anyway, so Govind left uh, on this plan to go to CSIRO. <clears throat> and over there, he undertook a number of projects. So the first uh, thing that he had been assigned to do was that, um, you know, there was an array telescope uh, at uh, CSIRO, uh, which, uh, you know, had done uh, strip scans of the sky. Um, and he had been assigned the task of the sun, particularly. That was the source which, you know, that was basically the radio source which was studied in the early days. And his job had been to convert these strip scan images into a two-dimensional map, which, uh, you know, I won't get into the details. Uh, I, I will admit I'm not, um, uh, you know, there, there are uh, hairy uh, details in here which I'm not completely on top of, but, um, uh, you know, he did it. Uh, and it was a lengthy manual calculation involving uh, having to do Fourier transforms numerically, but you know, in those days, numerically meant literally with one of those um, mechanical calculators scanning uh, things in a reading of values with a with a with a scale and so on and so forth. And so it was painstaking work, but he did uh, end up being able to make an image of the sun. And this is the first two D two dimensional radio image 
of the solar radio emission. And what you will notice straight away is that the emission is not um, uh, spherically symmetric. There are these two regions over here on the left and the right where the emission is much brighter than elsewhere. It's much brighter along uh, the longitude, um, along, uh, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the uh, equator of the, of, the, of the sun than along the poles. And it's also much brighter at the edges. And uh, this was, uh, you know, as had been predicted uh, by theories of limb brightening. Uh, and it was, you know, very important that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, observationally one was able um, to, to confirm that. Uh, in addition, he, this, was, uh, this map which I'm showing you was uh, done at a frequency of 21 centimeters, uh, and this had been with data that had already been take, taken. And Gobin basically uh, redid observations of the sun, uh, but at a much lower frequency, at a frequency of 500 megahertz, uh, using observations with the antennas in the Potts Hill array. Um, this is the array uh, over here of, of antennas. And uh, what he did was he modified all of those antennas to work at a frequency of 500 megahertz. And he and a colleague of his, Parthasarthi, who was also there, I think, on the Colombo plan, equipped the array to work at 500 megahertz. Now, basically what uh, you know, happened in an array like this was that the signals from all of the telescopes had to be added up together in phase. Uh, and it produced a kind of fan beam on the sky. Uh, and so, uh, you know, at the end of each uh, 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 and small antenna like this, you have an amplifier and that amplified signal is taken in an electrical cable and then it eventually has to be combined together. And so it's very important that, um, you know, since you have to add the antenna voltages up in phase, uh, when I transport the signal in a cable, there will be some phase that the cable itself will introduce uh, to the signal. And it's very important that we make sure that the phase introduced by the cable for the first antenna is the same as that in the second and third and so on and so forth. Basically, all of those cables have to give you the same phase. And so the signals have to be transported in phase. And there was a very, very cumbersome procedure to do that. Uh, you know, you, you compared uh, the phase that you got from the cable in this antenna with that you got in the next antenna, you equalized it by doing whatever adjustments you need to do, then you compare the second with the third antenna and so on and so forth. And it took, it took a very, very long time. So it was a cumbersome you know, phase adjustment procedure, which took days, but you know, they did do it. And they did find that even at a frequency of 500 megahertz, the solar limb does show edge bright. The sun does show uh, radio emission from the sun does show uh, you know, a limb brightening. And we'll come back uh, to all of these issues in a bit about transmission lines and um, and uh, you know having things in phase, et cetera, because these were issues that you know are going to crop up uh, you know as we keep uh, going through uh, our talk. All right, so uh, you know after that <coughs> stint of two years in Australia, Govind returned to the National Physical Laboratory. And uh, you know, just before he left, uh, the CSIRO where he was working had agreed that the pot sills antennas that he had been working on could be transferred to India. And uh, he could uh, take them to India and he could set them up over there to do uh, solar radio astronomy in India. But unfortunately, because of various bureaucratic issues, uh, uh, you know, these, um, that plan actually never got act actualized. And for this and other reasons, Radio astronomy never properly took up at, you know, never really took off at NPL. And the group that KS Krishnan put together uh, gradually dispersed. But as I said, uh, you know, many members of that group actually went on to become quite uh, uh, well known radio astronomers, uh, and they've all played, uh, uh, you know, an important role. And uh, so that effort that KS Krishnan put in was very important in the development of radio astronomy uh, in India. So Govind himself decided that he would continue radio astronomy in the US. And so he, 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 he went to Texas where Harvard University had set up a radio astronomy station, which at that time was the most sensitive system that you had for, for spectroscopy, so radio spectroscopy of the sun. And that's the system being shown over here in the upper photograph. Uh, there's Govind in the middle over here and two of his colleagues on either side of him. And there's the antenna uh, behind them. So, you know, the work done during this period included Govind's discovery of uh, a new type of uh, radio burst from the sun, which was called a U-type burst. It's a, actually an inverted U, which is what's shown in the lower picture. So it's showing a picture of the frequency at which the burst emission is coming, 
uh, uh, against time. So you can see that the frequency increases with time and then decreases again. And that gives you some idea as to what, what is going on over here. Where is this emission coming from? It's understood as coming from electrons, <clears throat> which are uh, uh, spiraling along magnetic fields that rise out into a solar corona and loop back again towards the sun. So after his stint at Harvard uh, College Observatory, Gurman took up a PhD at Stanford University with a very well-known radio astronomer, Ron Bracewell. And he worked uh, here, he had, uh, you know, he was supported uh, by Stanford University. And as part of that support, he was expected to do work on the Stanford Cross Antenna Array. And uh, the work that he had been, uh, that he was assigned to start with was to phase the array. And that he had to do very early in the morning before going for graduate uh, classes. And as I uh, uh, explained a short while ago, it's, it's very painful and mind numbing work where you just go on comparing uh, phases of uh, adjacent antennas and keep adjusting things to get it to be equal. And uh, so, you know, uh, needless to say, you know, if, uh, uh, Govind uh, found that repetitious job, uh, you know, somewhat irksome, and he, he, you know, wanted to find, he was keen to find a way to, you know, make it less irksome and do it more efficiently. And he did, in fact, come up with a way of doing that, which is basically that he modulated the signal at the far end and sent it back. Uh, and uh, that allowed him to measure the phase of the cable very efficiently. And, uh, uh, and you know, you didn't have to do this pair-by-pair uh, yeah, -pair comparison kind of thing. And it cut down the required time very dramatically. This, this uh, round-trip way of measuring the phase is now called the Swaroop and Yang system. And it is a technique which is widely used in many applications which require synchronization of separated equipment, including atomic clocks and so on and so forth. So it was, you know, a very important contribution he made on the way to his PhD. His PhD work itself uh, was on solar radio emission. And uh, after his PhD, he continued uh, at Stanford as an assistant professor. He had, um, you know, offers from other uh, leading universities in the US. But by that time, he was quite clear that he wanted to go back to India. And for that and other reasons, it made sense to just continue at Stanford, where he was already based and where things were already set up, and where work could continue while he sort of sorted out uh, his return to India. So, um, you know, around this time when he was finishing his PhD, um, Govind, along with other young radio astronomers, including uh, people who had been with him in the NPL group, uh, had developed quite a detailed proposal for starting a radio astronomy group in India. And uh, five of them sent this proposal to major, five major scientific uh, organizations in India. And the proposal was also sent uh, to prominent international radio astronomers. And they had been asked, these astronomers were asked to send assessments directly uh, to the funding and other scientific organizations uh, in India. Uh, and the most positive response this group got was from Homi Baba at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And uh, he said, yes, we will set up a, a radio astronomy group at TIFR. And uh, you, you know, he did go further than um, uh, just saying we'll set up a group. He said that if, and here's the quote, if your group fulfills the expectation we have of it, this could lead to some very big equipment and work in radio astronomy in India than we foresee at the present. So he's basically saying that, you know, if provided you fulfill our expectations, well, we will sort of, uh, you know, ensure that you're able to, to do big things. So Govind, uh, you know, took up this offer and um, uh, sort of moved back to India to the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And uh, on the way back, he stopped at the Netherlands, which uh, at that time was a powerhouse in radio astronomy. And it continues to be one of the leading countries um, where, uh, of, you know, for radio astronomy research. And he met with Jan Oort, who was, uh, you know, probably the most prominent astronomer in the Netherlands at that time. And Jan Oort at that time was uh, setting up a 25 meter, which for that time was a pretty big uh, telescope. Uh, at Dwingelo uh, in the Netherlands. And um, that time- uh, Jaram. Was, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, your audio has gone down uh, quite a bit, so yeah. Uh, okay, I'm not sure why. I'll just go a little closer to the mic. Is that yeah, better? Yeah, this is better. Yeah, this yeah. is better. Yeah. yeah, so uh, yeah, so he stopped by the Netherlands. I hope, uh, I'll just start from there. I hope that earlier parts were audible. And he met with this, uh, you know, very famous um, uh, astronomer, Jan Oort, uh, who at that time was busy setting up uh, uh, this telescope to observe the uh, radio emission from the hydrogen atom. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, during the war, um, uh, you know, the, 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 I think it was Jan uh, Oud's student himself in the Netherlands who had done the calculation, which uh, sort of showed that you would expect to be able to detect the radio emission from hydrogen in interstellar space. And uh, that emission had, in fact, been detected uh, after the war, just shortly before all of this. And uh, Oort was setting up a large telescope to study the distribution of hydrogen in the interstellar space. It was a very hot topic at that time, cutting edge science. And what uh, Oort suggested was that uh, the telescope he was setting up in the Netherlands would only be able to see the northern sky. And he suggested to Govind that he would help Govind set up uh, uh, you know, an identical telescope in India which would then be able to see the southern sky. And between the two, they would be able to do complementary science and get a full understanding of the distribution of, um, of hydrogen uh, in, um, you know, uh, in the galaxy. Uh, uh, Govind, and this was partly because of, uh, you know, um, uh, his own inclinations and also partly because of all of the advice he had got from his mentors in Australia, he felt it was much more important to carve out a niche for Indian radio astronomy than to follow fashions. And uh, you know, H1 was certainly you know, the hot topic at that time. Uh, and so he decided that he wouldn't follow this path. Um, he did do a lot of work in H1 later, and we'll talk about it in a bit. But at that time, he felt that he'd much rather strike on, on his own. And that, of course, had major implications for the development of Indian radio astronomy. And, you know, in my own view, it had quite positive implications for the way in which radio astronomy developed in India. So at TIFR, uh, you know, Govind's first project was to set up the Kalyan radio telescope. And he, for, to do that, he used the old Potts Hills antennas, which had finally reached India. Uh, and you, of course, you have to transport signals from one antenna to the other. And uh, for that, he used a novel and much simpler transmission line system than the original had used. And so that, of course, was an important innovation, which allowed things to move fast and cheaply. Um, but more importantly, it also provided a training ground, you know, setting up this telescope, coming up with their own ideas about how to, you know, that those were just dishes, how to take just dishes and make them into a radio telescope, you know, with, the, with all of the amplifier systems and so on, and then connecting all of them together. So all of that engineering were, were, was actually a good training ground for young manpower. And so that's what's being shown in this photograph over here. Uh, these are, it includes Govind's first PhD student, Vijay Kapahi, who himself was a very prominent radio astronomer, working on setting up the Kalyan uh, radio telescope. So this telescope was set up quickly and it yielded, again, you know, quite interesting results and observations of the, of the sun. But while all of this was going on, Govind was already thinking of a much bigger telescope. If you'll remember that, you know, before he had joined itself, uh, Baba had indicated that uh, TIFR would be open to, to big, you know, to big developments in radio astronomy. So, um, you know, let me now, uh, you know, motivate uh, the idea that Govind came up with. And to motivate that idea, I need to step back and go back to something we were talking about, uh, you know, many slides ago about resolution and about how uh, radio telescopes uh, of that time typically had very poor angular resolution. And because of that, you couldn't identify which exact source was the one emitting the radio waves. Right? And as I said, that happens primarily because radio wavelengths are much, much longer than the optical ones. And so you can't, you know, you find a radio source in the sky, but the region from in which that source could be is so large, it's very, very difficult to identify which of the optical, you know, stars or galaxies you have in that region is the radio source. So I'm showing, you know, just to illustrate the magnitude of the problem, this image that I have shown you over here uh, is of a field of view roughly comparable to that of uh, the Parkes radio telescope, uh, which was a 64 meter parabolic reflector antenna and one of the biggest antennas, uh, fully steerable reflecting antennas available at that time. So this is the field of view of that uh, radio telescope and it contains a very, very bright radio source called 3C273. Uh, now, if you were going to ask the question, which of these optical sources that I see in this image is the one which is emitting the radio waves, you'll realize it's a hopeless question. I mean, there are just so many sources over here, uh, you know, it, it, it's meaningless to ask, uh, you know, to even try and do some correlation and try and understand which one of these is the one which is emitting the radio source. If you want uh, radio waves, if you want to find that source, you need much, much, much better pinpointing of the source of radio waves. <clears throat> 
And that, in fact, is what the Parkes telescope managed to do. And it managed to do it by using a technique called uh, lunar occultation, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, but you know they did uh, this lunar occultation, which allowed them to locate the source much more accurately. And the moment they had an accurate position for the source, uh, then it became identified with a unique optical object. And uh, the spectrum of the object immediately showed that it was at what at that time was an extremely high redshift. It was a redshift of 0 0.158, uh, which meant that the source had to be extremely powerful. It was probably you know, the most powerful source known uh, at that time. Uh, we know now that uh, the, that source is powered by a supermassive black hole. Uh, at that time, um, uh, it was unclear what was powering the source. All they knew was that this is you know, extremely powerful source in the sky, more powerful than things that they've ever seen before. But at the same time, in the optical, it looked like a dot, like a, like a star. And so it was called a quasi-stellar object, a radio source, or a quasar. So these things are called quasars, so now they're called quas QSOs for quasi-stellar objects. Right, so, but the way this source had been identified was uh, by looking at, um, uh, uh, at lunar interferometry. Um, I should pause and I also realize that my the clock is ticking. Uh, uh, Anvesh, I need to finish at seven, right? No, yeah, yeah, but you can go a few minutes over this. Okay. This is the last session little... of the day, so okay. yeah, it's okay. okay. I might run a little over. If you take over, a little bit of yeah. time, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, and I'll pause also in case anybody wants to ask something. Yeah, I don't see any uh, raised hand or any questions yet. All right. So, so then I'll uh, plow ahead. So, uh, so lunar occultation. So basically, the moon can be approximated as a semi-infinite sc screen for distant radio sources. So you know, as the sharp edge of the moon uh, occults the radio source, you will get diffraction patterns uh, because of diffraction at a sharp edge. And that's what's being shown to you over here, that uh, there's a distant radio source, S, over here. There's the sharp edge of the moon, which is near, um, uh, you know, approaching the line of sight to this radio source. And as it approaches that line of sight, you begin to see diffraction patterns. The moon, of course, is moving in the sky. And as the lunar edge moves, this diffraction pattern will drift over the Earth. So if I have a telescope at a fixed location on the Earth, as the moon drifts over the, the radio source, I will see um, uh, the intensity vary uh, according to this diffraction pattern. And that's what's being shown in the lower panel over here, that you have the moon drifting across uh, the radio source line of sight to the radio source. You see the intensity sort of go up and down because of diffraction just before the moon completely occults the source. Then you see no emission while the moon totally occults the source. And then as the source emerges from the other edge of the moon, you see diffraction patterns again. And you know, uh, looking at this pattern allows you to very precisely locate the source. And so you, know, you get very high angular resolution, even in your, though your telescope's native angular resolution is not high. And again, it gives you uh, a measure of its angular size. So this is what um, you know, go the 3C2173, uh, that paper identifying it as an extragalactic radio source at this very high redshift had um, just been published in Nature and Govind was uh, we realized that this is a very important technique going forward. And he, he decided that what would be worth doing is to build a very large uh, telescope to, 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 to measure uh, you know, the, the angular sizes of a number of radio sources. So you know, triggered by this possibility, he decided that what's worth doing is to build a telescope to characterize the angular size of a large number of radio sources. And the scientific driver behind that was to measure the angular size flux relation of radio sources. And that would allow one to distinguish between two competing models of cosmology at that time, the steady state and the Big Bang cosmological model. So there's a big science question and certainly worth doing. But you know, technologically, there are two major challenges which needed to be overcome. The first is that the telescope would need to be steered fully. It couldn't be a telescope which was just parked and looking vertically upwards or something like that, because you do need to uh, observe a large number of radio sources, uh, radio sources which you know the moon might occult at some time or the other. So you need the ability to point at many, many locations in the sky. So you need a fully steerable telescope, otherwise the number of sources you, that you could observe would be very limited. The second is that you know you need a very sensitive telescope, so it would have to be very big. It would it, turned, it actually had to be four times bigger than the largest fully steerable telescope ever built anywhere in the world at that time. Uh, 
So how do you build in India, uh, you know, with the budgets that were available then, uh, a telescope four times bigger than, you know, the largest fully steerable telescope available anywhere in the world? So Gobind came up with this very innovative idea that uh, building a large cylindrical telescope, cylinders are much cheaper to build than parabolas, parabolic or um, paraboloid antennas. So, you know, you build a large cylindrical telescope, but you keep its long axis parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. Uh, and if you do that, then just by rotating around one axis, you can uh, track a source, right? Because your rotation axis is parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. So you get the steerable antenna with just one axis motion. Um, to keep it, parallel, keep it parallel to the Earth's rotation axis, you need to keep mount the antenna on a north-south hill slope. And the gradient of that slope has to be equal to the latitude of the, uh, of the telescope. And so that's exactly what uh, he proposed to do. Uh, Homi Baba was extremely supportive of the project. He obtained funding for the telescope as well as an associated inter-university center for training of students. Uh, but you know, one should appreciate that the engineering challenges were enormous. I mean, it was a huge mechanical structure and that structure had to be built on a slope, right? Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, there had to be very specialized designs which were done at that, uh, by TCE, what is now TCE, when at that time was called Tata Abesco. Um, and also it was a time when foreign exchange was very, very scarce. And so all kinds of things, you couldn't import things. You had to find ways of making them uh, uh, in-house. And so, and that included very basic things like coaxial cable and N-type connectors. And uh, so uh, they weren't available in India. And so they had to be developed for the first time. And Govind sort of got people to develop these things based on conceptual designs that he provided. Again, going back to you know, the MIT Radiation Lab series uh, notes that I uh, had uh, mentioned earlier. And so you know, basically, one had to work with industries, work with vendors, develop, you know, get them to start doing things um, you know, which were more challenging than they had uh, taken up earlier. And so it's a Herculean task, uh, but nonetheless, you know, uh, it, it was all done. And the telescope was made operational by 1970. And what I'm showing you over here is basically, you know, the first sort of uh, the first sort of digging in the ground being ceremonially done by MGK Menon, who was the director of TIFR at that time, because Homi Baba uh, had, uh, you know, tragically passed away in an accident. All right, and so the Uti radio telescope came into being on a north-south hill slope in Uti with a slope of 11 degrees. It's, it's a very, very large telescope. It's a parabolic cylinder, uh, 530 meters long. That's more than half a kilometer long, 30 meters wide. Um, it's an offset parabola uh, and it's fed uh, uh, by a set of 1,056 dipoles uh, located along this line that I'm running my mouse across. And it's an offset parabola, which has two advantages. Uh, one of them is that this feed line, when the telescope is brought to the Western limit, that feed line comes very close to the ground and it's easy, you get easy access for maintenance. And the second is that there's no blockage. Um, you know, if, I, if it was a standard parabola where, the, where it was fed from the center, then the shadow of the feed would fall on the reflector. Whereas if you offset it in this way, um, the shadow of the feed doesn't fall on the reflector and so there's no blockage. Uh, the reflecting surface, which you can't see uh, over here, but there is a reflecting surface uh, which reflects the radio waves. It consists of thin stainless steel wires. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, this telescope can be rotated about its long axis uh, to, to, to track sources in the sky. And the dipole signals are combined together to form the telescope beam. And those signals can be combined with different phases. And depending on how you phase the antenna, you can actually steer the beam in the north-south direction. So that allows you know, two axes pointing off this telescope. And uh, so you get a fully steerable telescope, one axis being steered mechanically, the other axis being steered electronically. The UT radio telescope had a transformative effect uh, on Indian radio astronomy and did work on all kinds of things, including, of course, the angular size flux relation of radio sources, which had been one of the main science drivers. It also enabled, uh, you know, quite detailed studies of the interstellar medium of the galaxy via radio recombination lines, studies of the heliosphere via scintillation sources, studies of pulsars, studies of redshifted hydrogen, which I'll tell you uh, about in a little bit. And um, it also, you know, and I think this is equally, if not more important, it trained a whole generation of radio astronomers and engineers. The telescope is still uh, functional. It continues to be in regular use today. And in fact, it's being currently upgraded and is expected to continue to do important science. 
All right. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it was a single dish radio telescope. And so it had um, limited um, uh, resolution. And what one would really like is to have a telescope with better resolution. And as I said, that kind of resolution is achievable uh, if you use an array. Uh, and ideally, you'd like to have an array which allows you to make images of the source. You'd like to make radio images with the images having very high angular resolution. And that is possible if you co uh, combine the signals in a more complicated way than just adding them together. The very simple things we looked at together just earlier, you just take the voltages of the two antennas and you add them together. But instead of doing that simple operation, if instead you correlate the voltages, which is basically you multiply the voltages together and then you integrate for a little while, uh, you get something called a visibility. And that visibility actually has very interesting mathematical properties. Uh, it basically uh, is uh, you know, one component of the Fourier transform of the image. And that corresponds to the spatial frequency of B over lambda, where B is the separation between the antennas under a set of assumptions, which I want to go through. So basically, you know, since you are measuring a component of the Fourier transform, you could imagine if I lay enough interferometers on the ground, I can measure, uh, you know, a large number of Fourier components of the image. If I know the Fourier components of the image, I can do an inverse Fourier transform and I will get the image itself, right? So that is basically the way in which images are done in radio astronomy. You synthesize a telescope of size equal to the array size. Um, and certain tricks that you could use when you're doing that. And so one of the main ones is that, you know, if you're looking at an astronomical source, it, it, its statistical properties really don't vary a whole lot with time. Typically, some sources do, but the bulk of them don't. So if I want to synthesize a large aperture, I could use repeated observations, but there's a very small number of antennas whose spacing can be varied. That is, I measure all the small spacings, then after a while I measure the long spacings, and you know, next month I measure still longer, and next year I measure still longer, and so on. It just doesn't matter. I can still put them all together and um, you know, uh, invert them to get a Fourier transform. Another way of doing this is to just track the source as it rises and sets, because as the source rises and sets, the projected separation between two antennas will change. Um, you know, if you assume the antennas are, are located on an east-west line, uh, you know, the projected separation would be maximum when um, the sources are, are, are rising and they would be minimum uh, when the, I'm sorry, they would be maximum when the sources are vertically overhead and they would be minimum when the source is rising or setting, right? So, you know, j just by tracking the source, I will measure a large number of Fourier components uh, without ac actually having to move any of the antennas. And I think, uh, I don't know if you can see that animation, I hope you can. It's a very uh, simplistic animation showing you the basic idea that uh, the projected separation between the antennas changes. And so I end up measuring many more components in the Fourier plane than you might have otherwise imagined. All right, so, you know, with that in mind, um, uh, a synthesis telescope was built in OT uh, to enable imaging, uh, an array of small uh, telescopes were set around the main telescope, and that's what this schematic is showing you over here, uh, uh, um, you know, showing you the main uh, OT telescope and then all the small telescopes set up around it. They were called baby cylinders, which were 22 meters into nine meters long. They were connected to the main telescope via radio links. Um, and it, that, you know, this UT synthesis radio telescope was operational for a relatively short period of time. And it was made, used to make several images at uh, 327 megahertz. Excuse me, I'll just check if this is unbeish. No, no, it's not me. <laughs> It's not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So then uh, let me continue. Uh, but what has happened? I've lost the screen share, right? Yes, you have lost the screen share. So yeah, just give me a moment. Yeah. Sure. All right. Here we go. Yeah, again. We are back. So, yeah. so it was used to make several images at uh, 327 megahertz. But I think more important, you know, than the science that it did was that it was a very, very useful training ground for building up expertise in the country for building a synthesis radio telescope. And that gave the confidence to, to, to build the next big telescope, which is the GMRT, the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. By the mid 1980s, Govind was planning the next big telescope. Um, you know, given the high importance of high angular resolution, it was clear that this telescope should be an array. The original concept was to have an array of 34 parabolic cylinders spread over a large area. 
Uh, and this already was quite challenging because the only existing interferometer of this size was a very large array located in New Mexico in, 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 in the US, which is an area which is very thinly populated, very flat. Um, and uh, what they did uh, to, you know, in, uh, in an interferometer uh, or in, in an array of any sort, you have to transport um, the radio signals to a central location, right? And you have to transport it with very low loss. Now, if you have short distances, you could transport it along a, a, a coaxial cable or something like that. But if you're trying to transport a signal over many kilometers, it doesn't work to try, transport it in a coaxial signal, coaxial cable, the loss is too much. So uh, the, the very large array used waveguides, um, you know, which are these rectangular hollow aluminum, uh, you know, uh, tubes, uh, which have to be of, uh, you know, of an exact dimension to transport the wave without loss. Um, and, uh, you know, they also have to be, lay, they can't have bends or kinks in them. They, you know, uh, you'll, you'll have reflections and loss and so on and so forth. So all of this was laid out in the desert in New Mexico to connect the antennas together. That's not practical in India, where, you know, you don't have such large, flat, thinly populated areas. You know, you know there's people everywhere, there's agricultural activities, there are all kinds of things going on. It's not practical to think about connecting things with this sort of, uh, you know, waveguide. So Govind decided that what he would do was to use optical fibers to connect this, uh, the antennas, which is, you know, was a very, very radical innovation at that time. Optical fibers were just beginning to appear in the scene. Uh, and, uh, you know, when the JMRT finally was uh, built and put up, the order that was placed uh, for optical fibers for the JMRT was by far the largest order for optical fibers ever to go out of India uh, up to that time. Now, of course, optical fibers are, you know, a completely standard thing, but we should remember we are talking about a time which is about 40 years ago. Uh, there was another radical uh, innovation that was needed. Uh, so originally the idea was to have parabolic cylinders, but these uh, cylinders actually have limited frequency and steering ranges compared to parabolic dishes. But as I had mentioned, they're much cheaper to build than dishes. Uh, you know, but ideally you would have preferred to have dishes. And so there's a lot of this thing that why are we doing cylinders? Why can't we do dishes, et cetera? And so Govind finally came up with a radical design for a lightweight, cheap radio antenna. And, uh, you know, this exploited the fact that this telescope is to work only at low radio frequencies. It had to be located in areas with, you know, at the, in Pune, basically, where it never snows. So you don't need that much of a backup structure. So the kind of traditional designs for parabolic radio uh, dishes, which were built for cold countries to work at high frequencies and so on and so forth, really wasn't needed uh, for a telescope of this sort. So Govin came up with a design where the parabolic shape is achieved not by having, uh, you know, heavy steel trusses which are, you know, shaped to parabolic uh, 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 shapes and onto which you put uh, uh, panels. Um, that's not how it's done at the GMRT. Instead of these, um, you know, you have very few of these um, uh, structural uh, steel uh, parabolic frames, uh, uh, but instead you have a large number of rope trusses instead of, you know, uh, steel trusses. And these rope trusses with uh, appropriate tension uh, are, are given a parabolic shape and the mesh is then just attached to this truss. And that allowed the fabrication of the antennas at a fraction of the traditional cost. And that's really what allowed the GMRT to be built. Of course, you need, you know, you want to build a bigger array, etc. You should have a, a, a major science goal that you're trying to achieve. And the science goal that Govind had was to detect uh, uh, hydrogen, you know, so going back to things that people had been talking about when he was first moving back to India, Govind, of course, had been very interested in, 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 in this problem of, uh, you know, of, uh, of atomic hydrogen in very distant objects. I'm going to skip over this slide given the time. So, you know, given the time at which the GM, at the time when the GMRT was proposed, there were two models for the formation of galaxies. One of them was a top-down model where you have very, very large objects which form first and then fragment to form galaxies. And the other was a bottom-up model where you have small objects which collapse first and then merge to form the galaxies. And, uh, you know, which of these two happen depend on the kind of dark matter that you have in the universe. The top-down model was uh, favored if you had hot dark matter. Uh, the bottom-up model was favored if you had cold dark ma ma matter. Uh, and, you know, at the time when the GMRT was proposed, the top-down model was a favored model. And so you would expect to see collapsed objects, uh, you know, uh, in the very early universe. And these objects were also predicted to have a flat geometry. They were supposed to be flat like a pancake or a dosa. And so they were called Zeldovich pancakes. Uh, 
And so a major um, goal for the JMRT was to try and detect uh, the hydrogen emission from these early uh, structures in the universe. And in fact, it was something that he had already started doing with the UTI radio telescope and then formed uh, uh, the PhD thesis of Ravi Subramaniam, another you know, person who went on to become a very prominent radio astronomer uh, uh, to search for uh, H1 uh, from these protoclusters of pancakes using the UTI radio telescope. And the design of the JMRT also folded in the science case. Um, uh, it has a kind of hybrid design where you have a number of antennas, 12 antennas in a compact array at the center. And the angular resolution of that uh, configuration is well matched to that expected from protoclusters. There were also uh, a number of antennas which are spread out uh, on a Y-shaped arm. And that gave you very, very high angular resolution also. And uh, the combination allows, uh, makes the telescope extremely flexible and allows it to do a huge range of, uh, tackle a huge range of science problems. So um, I think I have probably go on for another five minutes. Um, you know, the JMRT was uh, built and commissioned in 2000. It consists of an array of 30 antennas, each 45 meters in diameter, using this novel cost-effective antenna design. And it is the most sensitive radio telescope in the world in most of its frequencies of operation. Uh, I'll just skip over this, which I've already talked to you about. Um, and, you know, I'll just say that um, uh, this hybrid configuration gives it, you know, the very, very good coverage of the Fourier domain. So this is uh, on this uh, uh, left panel, I show you uh, the coverage that you get from just with the Y arm antennas, uh, the antennas which are in those Y shaped arms. And you can see you get good coverage going out to about 25 kilometers. I've also zoomed in at the center uh, to see what these antennas in the central square give you. And uh, this is what inside the central one kilometer you would get using just the antennas within that. And you can see that again gives you a very good coverage over there. So you get you know, good coverage of both the central parts of the Fourier plane as well as um, you know, going out to large distances. And that gives you the ability to image all kinds of sources, um, you know, large diffuse sources as well as compact, complex sources with a lot of fine structure. Um, uh, the JMRT, as it was built, uh, had, um, you know, feeds on a rotating turret um, over here. Uh, and uh, depending on which frequency you wanted to observe, you could rotate the, that given feed to face the focus. And uh, it allowed operation in five different frequency bands. There were four faces of the turret, but one of the feeds worked at two frequencies. The electronic chain and digital backend supported a maximum of 32 megahertz bandwidth. And uh, the backend also simultaneously supported two major modes of operation. One was correlation, which allowed you to make images of the sky. And the other was a, a high time resolution, you know, beam formed mode, which allowed you to study pulsars and other kind of compact objects. Uh, since then, uh, the telescope has been upgraded. Uh, the upgrade has just recently completed, um, you know, and it uh, uh, could be regarded as a completely new telescope. Everything apart from the steel and concrete has been changed. And uh, in, you know, now the telescope offers nearly seamless coverage from 30 megahertz to 1500 megahertz. There are small gaps in the coverage, and this is typically uh, chosen to be in regions where there's very, very strong radio frequency interference from television or something else, which means that in any case, you're not likely to get useful data there. The instantaneous maximum bandwidth has changed to 400 megahertz, um, which increases the raw sensitivity by a factor of three, and also gives you large improvements in image fidelity. The GMRT has an open sky policy, which means that astronomers from all over the world could submit proposals. They're invited twice a year, and time allocation is done by an independent time allocation committee, which just allocates time based on international peer review. And it turns out about half the time is used by Indian astronomers and half the time is used by astronomers from around the world. All right, uh, there are many things which I have not covered. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I haven't talked about Govin's contributions um, to building um, uh, you know, uh, uh, antennas for satellite communication, which again was a very major and important contribution. Uh, all of which got uh, you know, enabled by the fact that radio astronomy and antenna design and antenna engineering, uh, you know, that expertise became available in the country and Govind played a major role. In, in early uh, development of ground stations in India. I've also not talked about Govind's efforts uh, on the international regime, uh, uh, where he, you know, he had, again, a very major role uh, in uh, working with international radio astronomers uh, 
to try and set up large collaborative international um, uh, facilities, um, you know, including <clears throat> the facility which now is, uh, you know, the big facility of the future, the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, Govind was one of the early people, uh, pioneers who sort of pushed and set up that collaboration to build this telescope. But I won't, uh, you know, given the time, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to end by talking about Govind's role in student training. And, you know, as I mentioned in the very first slide, he, he was fortunate, you know, to have very good, you know, very excellent teachers and that, you know, really impressed on him the importance of having, uh, you know, good training in undergraduate years and um, the importance of training scientists and engineers. And so, you know, throughout his career, the training of people was very important. As I mentioned, the whole generation got trained at the Kalyan radio telescope, the Uti radio telescopes and so on, uh, and, and including at the JMRT. So when the JMRT was being designed, again, a whole fresh young team of engineers was recruited and you know, uh, got, uh, got sort of trained uh, in these new uh, techniques using, you know, at that time, all of these new technologies like fiber optics and so on and so forth. And in addition, of course, he had a very large number of PhD students, many of whom uh, went on to, to themselves have more students and so on and so forth, and which uh, led to the growth of uh, the radio astronomy community in India. He also played a very important role in setting up various training programs, including the JAP program, which is a multi-institutional program for training of astronomers. But, you know, it, he was always sort of of the view that undergraduate science education in India is very, very important. And he felt you know, particularly you know, by, you know, 2000 when he was uh, winding down from the GMRT that uh, he, he should now take up this cause. Um, and he felt that, um, you know, that the universities in India were not uh, uh, imparting adequate, um, yes, you know, training in science uh, to students. And you know this this idea that students and large number of students should be trained was always important to him. If you recall, the Uti telescope was originally supposed to be part of the Inter University Center, that unfortunately did not happen, and that was again related to the fact that Homi Baba, uh, you know, passed away unfortunately at, you know, uh, through in an accident. And after Govind retired from TIFR, he got back into this effort of trying to set up new institutions for undergraduate education in science and engineering. And, uh, you know, it was, I would say, more than a decade of effort uh, of working with the government and um, yeah, developing proposals, taking it up with the ministry and so on and so forth. And till they finally took shape with the help of uh, uh, other people, of course, uh, and uh, that finally uh, took the shape of the establishment of the ISERS. Uh, um, you know, which got uh, founded about a decade ago and which, you know, themselves have had now a major role uh, in the training of young uh, people in science in India. So I think that's all I had to say today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jaram. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, I invite the students to uh, raise your hands and ask questions or to write your questions in the chat. Uh, there are a couple of uh, questions from the YouTube chat, so I will just uh, relay that. So uh, somebody has asked regarding this uh, lunar occultation method. Yes. Why is it? Why is the moon called a semi-infinite screen? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, meaning that it um, uh, it has an edge. An infinite screen would have no edge at all. Uh, you know, it would be infinite in all both directions, right? So it wouldn't have a boundary. So it's semi-infinite because it has one edge and you assume that the other edge is infinitely far away. Yeah. Okay. Um, then somebody has asked, why do we use radio waves for astronomy purposes? Ah, that's a good question. And um, the answer is, uh, you know, they're twofold. One of them is that if you, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at the atmosphere and the, um, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the way we are located, we are located on a planet, a planet which has an atmosphere. And uh, above the atmosphere, there is uh, this ionized gas, which is called the ionosphere. And uh, so, um, you know, if you ask yourself the question, what kind of electromagnetic radiation from body, electromagnetic radiation from outer space can reach you? It turns out that actually most of the radiation from outer space will not reach the surface of the Earth. And this is a good thing because much of this radiation is harmful to life. Uh, it turns out that there are very specific wavelengths at which radiation generated in outer space can reach the surface of the Earth. 
One of them is the optical wavelengths, um, you know, the wavelengths at which uh, the sun is the brightest and the wavelengths at which we see and which, you know, all of that light is what sustains life on Earth. That is one wavelength, a set of wavelengths which reaches the Earth. And the other important window is radio waves. Radio waves are the other place where the atmosphere and ionosphere are transparent, and these waves can actually reach the Earth. So, um, you know, you can build telescopes on the Earth and observe um, uh, uh, extraterrestrial sources. If you want to observe at other wavelengths, such as gamma rays or X-rays or something like that, it's not possible to do that from the surface of the Earth. You have to launch a satellite to do that. And you know that's a very expensive business and it's very difficult to launch big telescopes into space and so on. And so that is you know, one of the reasons why radio astronomy is important. It's one of the things you can do very sensitively from the surface of the Earth. And the second thing is that, um, you know, if you look at the interstellar space, um, it has stars and things in it, but uh, between the stars, it's not a vacuum. Uh, you know, as I indicated, there's definitely hydrogen gas between the stars, but there are also dust particles, very fine particles of dust. And uh, these fine dust particles eventually begin to obscure the starlight. So, you know, beyond a certain distance, it's difficult to see stars or in certain directions where there's a lot of dust you can't see in the optical because uh, the dust completely blocks the light. However, these are directions in which radio waves have no uh, problem propagating um, because uh, the dust does not obscure the radio waves. So you can see in directions where you cannot see with optical telescopes. Thank uh, you. I'm yeah. yeah, thank you. So uh, I don't uh, see any raised hand yet or any question. Uh, one thing I, I mean, this is just a comment. I think you brought out very nicely what you said uh, at the very beginning that, I mean, sometimes we take for granted about the facilities and the laboratories. And I think your talk brought out very nicely how years of hard work by scientists backed up by very solid science goals are necessary to build such things. I mean, these things are not given and are not readily available. I mean, just out of nothing. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, I think your talk brought that out very nicely. And I uh, encourage the students to take note of that also, because, I mean, I think it's very important to realize that it is scientists who have to bring up, I mean, really nice proposals and to convince people, uh, the funding agencies, and to put in years of hard work to build such facilities like GMRT and uh, everything else that we have. So uh, thank you for highlighting this in this talk. <laughs> it came out very nicely, I thought. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, if there are uh, no further questions, I uh, uh, I request everybody to uh, unmute and applaud uh, Professor Chengalur for, uh, for his talk, and thank you, Jaram, for. <laughs> thank you for taking out time uh, from your busy schedule to do this. Well, uh, there's one question now that has again come up. Uh, somebody has asked that, can you tell us why the 21 centimeter hydrogen line is so widely studied? Ah, okay, that it's widely studied because hydrogen is um, the most abundant element in the universe. And uh, so it allows one, you know, to trace, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, if I have big structures and so on and so forth, they will definitely contain a lot of hydrogen. And that can be traced with the 21 centimeter line. So, you know, you are tracing the dominant component of the universe. It's, you know, an excellent way to begin to understand how uh, things formed even, at, you know, in the very early universe and so on, uh, because the best tracer in a sense is this 21 centimeter line. It's tracing this bulk component of, of what you have out there. Thank you. Thank you. I think with that, we will uh, close. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Chengalu, for doing this yeah, for NIUS. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.